the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. And David, again, our guest, Bill King. Now, when a person has heart surgery, one of the key questions that he wants to ask is, how many have you done before mine? Okay, now that's within a hospital. Think about the guys who are actually having to work in the field all the time. Yeah, I think of a, of a military field doctor, and whatever kind of surgery it is, there will be a multiple of surgeries that they do every day, every hour, just because. That's it's just that's, pure practicality. It is. Yeah. It's, it's the rate at which things are done in the midst of war. And, and I think that kind of experience gives you a certain instinct and a certain sort of uh, literally battle-hardenedness. Well, and where we're going is Bill King is that kind of guy in the financial markets. I mean, he I, I can't help but smile when we're talking to Bill because he's just coming out and he's giving you his experience and he's just raw with the information. Bill, it's great to have you back. Well, looking at market dynamics, where is the economic growth going to come from? By what's implied in current prices? In our family, I'm the optimist, and, and I'm, I'm not seeing it. I think the market has it terribly wrong. It's woefully complacent. You know, we've had somewhat disappointing earnings, and yet we find ourselves above 13,000 on the Dow. If you take out the financials, we're at all-time highs in the S&P 500. What am I not seeing here, Bill? I mean, the market knows something that I don't, or, or is the market just dead wrong? Well, it, it's not a question of dead wrong. If the market is, you know, is reality. That's what the prices are. But what is different is the stock market no longer reflects economic activity. It is not a gauge for centuries. It was a gauge of economic, a barometer of the economy. Well, that all fell apart over the last decade or so because you had a huge divergence. Well, you know, it's a game. It's a casino parlor game, and it's largely because of the easy money. And that's what's perverted the stock market. And that is what's vexing the Fed. You know, if you remember when... Bernanke was taken a task by Congress and media about what did QE to do. The first word out of his mouth, it got the stock market up. It had nothing to do with the economy, and it didn't. In fact, it hurt the economy by uh, getting inflation roaring in 2011. That's why we haven't had any more QE, because they're scared that they're going to not do anything for the economy, but they're going to boost inflation. To get back to your point, the stock market is a separate game from the economy now. It's trader-driven. It's computer trading, high frequency, it's proprietary trading desk, on and on. Because by and large, over this whole post-crisis recovery, the average investor has been taking money out. They keep taking money out, and there might be some judgment there on the economic prospects and you know what's going to happen next. But more bigger issue is people are liquidating to keep solvent or to maintain living standards or just to prevent living standards from falling further. And this is what happens in a very difficult economic environment is people use up their resources. And that is the major issue that we're facing right now is that this recovery has been so bad that the people that were savers or were able to hang on here are exhausting their resources. And it's one thing to use resources to build for future growth. It's another thing to use resources to survive. And this isn't a supposition as a guess. If anybody goes talk to accountants, especially accountants that do a lot of business, a lot of a lot of uh, small business people, this is what we've heard. We've heard for over a year that people that were smart enough or lucky enough to survive the crisis have just been holding on, holding on, holding on, holding on, and they're exhausting their resources in both maintaining their businesses and in, in maintaining their their household standard of living. And if you don't start getting this economy cooking really good. You're going to have really big trouble in 2013. Well, we have a rally at present, and as you say, that has nothing to do with the economy, but we've had a rally through the summer months on fairly light volume. You know, any thoughts? I mean, because we have two things butting up against each other, the seasonality of your classic September, October nightmare months, plus <laughs> volume's been awful. I mean, that's why you get these real ugly falls. They don't, falls aren't always very ugly. The typical time when you get problems is that April, May, and again in the fall. And the reason is, is because Wall Street gets you fork in the first quarter. All the hype, all the, everything's going to be great. Companies will like to issue a lot of debt early in the year, so they give the rosiest projections. You know, it's psychological. That first quarter, the big pop, everybody gets excited, and you get hit in the fall, especially if you have a bad economy or global problems. 
And that's why 2012 is trading exactly like 2011. All the big hype and hope there in the first quarter. Europe blows up. Everything goes to hell. Then we cobble together some BS bailouts. And you, and you stop the decline. And then summer shows up. Real activity drops to almost nothing because people understand there's a big rig on. But the traders take over the market. When the traders take over the market because it's thin, they just jam it up, jam it up, jam it up. That's what happened in 1987. Back then, it was program trading in the index arbitrage. And it was the rumor trage, all the takeover rumors that were going around in 87. And they did that in the summer on light volume. Nobody cared. And then when people show up in the fall, it gets ugly. And it's happened in 89, 86. Uh, 87. You've had that back in 70. Well, 79 is a little different because Volcker was raising rates in October of 78, 1907, 1929. Almost any of these real disaster years, especially when you have a slumping economy, when you you get this summer rally on light volume and uh, public and, and not participating, it tends to be ugly in the fall when 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 people get back and reality shows up. Now, of course, the other little difference we have this year is this November election. And that is another reason why people aren't playing here. You have unprecedented central planning and government intervention in the economy and the marketplace. Whether it's GM stuffing cars into dealers and government. You know, GM car sales were up 76% in June to government, and they didn't lay off. And one of the reasons you're getting some better economic data in industrial production and jobless claims in July is normally every year in July, uh, automotive workers get laid off because you do your retooling for the new models. They did not do this this year. It's strictly political to make the unemployment, make the industrial production look better for the election because we know car sales stunk. Inventories are building up everywhere globally. So it's largely a political move. And again, once the election passes, this will all disappear and you're going to have to pay a price. You see this today with the Treasury telling Fannie and Freddie they're going to have to liquidate their portfolios 50% more next year. Right now, they're told that they can have to liquidate 10% a year. Next year, it's going to 15 Why is this important? Because Fannie and Freddie own repossessed properties. They kept them off the market to make the housing look better, to not suppress prices, to not create a problem. There's a lot of things that have gone on to make the economy look for election. It's not just this present. It goes on every election year. That's why you tend to get these kind of plays in election years. But then after the election, the ensuing year, everything falls off. This year, everybody understands this financial cliff thing. It's going to hit in 2013, the tax hikes and the budget cuts, unless something has changed. People see that, but a lot of people aren't paying attention to all the gimmicks that are done to dress up economic data, to make things look better. All these little games are being played because it is an election year. Now, also, you have a lot of spending that is done in an election year, state, local, and government, hiring people for campaigns, hiring people wherever you can for the same reasons, for political reasons, for there's a lot of workers, a lot of campaign expenses going on that will boost employment, will boost spending. All this money that's raised in the campaigns, all this campaigning will all disappear shortly. You know, you see how bad the economy is, and this should be a great year because it's an election year. When it's not, you know, you have to worry about what's going to happen the next year. The stock market, again, is divorced. It's a trader's game. The same thing happened in the summer of 2008. We had the Dow Jones Transportation Average, which is supposed to be the most sensitive economic barometer, made an all-time high in July. The U.S. was at least two quarters in the recession, if not more. How could that happen? It's not supposed to happen. How the stock market's supposed to lead? Well, it was a trader's game then, and it's, it's even more of a trader's game now. Bill, when I think it was the summer of 2008, we had a conversation. You were on the program, and we were talking about you know the changes in the credit markets, and, and the you know, commercial paper was – some strange things were happening. And you were talking about just paying off the house and making sure you had a few ounces in the, in the safety deposit box. And I mean, there was probably more palpable concern – from me to you, you to me, than I, I've ever seen, at least in your writings. Are we in a similar place? I mean, when you reference 87 or the summer of 2008 and lump that in with 1907 and 1929, that's kind of <laughs> 2012. I, frankly, I don't know if I want to be the politician inheriting 2013, but that's another issue. Where are you at in terms of your own fear factor? Well, the biggest difference now, and as you know, because we talk often, 
is in 2008, we had a huge, huge crisis. But now it's become apparent to anybody thinking we have that is not the crisis. The crisis is the still in front of us. Because in 2008, it was the financial systems in the world were collapsing from years of abuse, over leverage, lax regulation, fraud, you name it. And that's going on for decades because that was the new economy. That was producing money, whether it was producing tax revenue or it was producing graft and donations to Congress. They allowed this to go on. So when it blew up, they could not allow this to blow up and take everything down because the culpability you can put directly at Washington, D.C. and in New York, you know, the financial area. So they had it. They were working together. Now, what we know has happened here, Europe and elsewhere is that sovereign governments bailed out their financial systems to prevent political revolution, if not some harder revolution. In so doing, they've bankrupted themselves. And that's the moral of the story in Europe. To protect it, the big banks, they've bankrupted themselves. Now, because of that, everybody's going all in. They can't stop this game because you will get political revolution. The whole system's coming apart. So for most people that are alive today, the big hook that Wall Street held over everybody's head was two, actually a twofold. Yeah, things could get bad, but the Fed is always here to save you. They'll always be able to print money and save you. And the second is, so the government, the government can always save somebody. They may not choose not to. That's the consideration. Do you let Lockheed go under? Do you let certain industries go under? Or do you save them? But now you're at the point where you government can't save. They have to save themselves. So that is what, for everybody alive today, that is the big issue. And that's why you saw this surge in gold over the last four years. Actually, three. It's been flat for a year, and there's a good reason why it's flat. But in the aftermath of 2008, every important person, very important person that I talked to, including heads of the big five brokerage firms, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, these type of people, all were buying gold in 2008 and thereafter. That was their haven because they understood what was going on. Now, why hasn't gold gone anywhere over the last year, even though the banks are pumping? My main thought is uh, two reasons. One is it goes back to this concept of using up your resources to stay alive. A lot of people, especially the wealthy people, have got bought what they needed. There was a panic in, and now the gold market is kind of digesting all that. The other issue is the Fed, for all the talk about doing QE and POMOs and we're going to pump money and save everybody, their balance sheet is flat on the year. Their asset level is actually down, I think I looked, it's down 17 or $20 billion from a year ago. That's the reason why there's gold blessed at Spojo here. And silver is even worse because silver is more of an inflationary play. So for all the talk and all the nonsense going on, the Fed is pretty much unchanged here. So that actually begs a really huge question. Why is Wall Street so excited? Well, you see what the Fed is doing. They send out the doves to talk about, we're going to give you QE if things get worse. They've been saying this for over a year. You got the same idiots out there saying, oh, you're going to get QE next week. For a year, major brokerage firms, ex-officials of central banks, and especially this one guy from the Bank of uh, England is running around town, has been saying that they're going to give you QE for over a year. It's not happened. And the one thing they've been able to do is not even do the QE threatened to do QE. That's what this whole summer rally is. It's the threat of doing QE. Remember how you had to get it because you had to be in here because they were going to give it to you in June. Oh, that didn't happen. They're going to give it to you in August. Oh, that didn't happen. They're going to give it to you September 12th. We'll see. I doubt they're going to do that. So they don't have to do it. And that's, I think, one of the things that was going on here is that because it's only traders, it's a thin market, they can give you the threat of easy money and they're keeping the game going, but they're not giving you the QE here. One of the interesting things there is that you have a similar correlation of assets like we had in mm -hmm. 08 and 09, and it's it's more to do with Fed dependence. The new element increasing correlation of assets is Fed dependence. To print or not to print, that's the question. You're absolutely right. And the point is, it's not that they're not printing. It's that they're not increasing the printing. And see, now this is what presents the problem, is when people talk about the exit strategy you're getting out, and I think we talked about this before, is that people talk about, gee, Paul Volcker, and Ronald Reagan broke the back of inflation and government spending and all this in the 80s, and they gave us two decades. Volcker never really tightened reserves. He let rates go up. He said that. I don't care what rates go. I'm going to take the punch bowl away. Well, people assumed that he took away reserves out of the banking system. He never did. He slowed the growth to a very low rate. Ronald Reagan did the same thing in government. He didn't cut. He slowed the growth rate. And look what that produced. 
So when you talk about we're going to cut budget, we're going to actually cut. You're going to cut and make a real cut. Or if the Fed really has to disgorge their balance sheet, oh, my God, if that's what you get. So and Goldman Sachs and a few of the other big firms have made this point over the last year. That's why they were screaming for QE. They're saying, well, it's no longer a question of how much, how big the Fed's balance sheet is. It's how much are they doing each month? In other words, this change, are they constantly increasing the amount of liquidity? And if you don't, so, and, it, and what's so stupid about that is like if you've got a barrel of beer left over at a fraternity party and you're making the assumption as well, maybe we, we should give them three barrels, they'll drink more. And they still don't. Well, let's give them six. Aren't you making a point? There's too much there. It doesn't matter. So what Wall Street is saying is, well, if it's not that there's two or three barrels there. It's that you've got to keep increasing that. You've got to keep giving them another barrel to make them drink. They're missing the point. But that's the new rationale over the past six months or so was it's not that the Fed balance sheet is $2.8 trillion. It's that they have to keep putting increasing reserves out every month. And they haven't. And that's one of the, the reasons, the main reason, as far as I'm concerned, that gold has just been flat on the year is that, you know, for all the, the, the talk about gold being, you know, the, the type of market and the barbarous metal and whatever, the difference, one of the major differences between gold and stock is that when the big informed money are playing in gold, it is a very, very sophisticated market. You're talking to the smartest, most connected people in the world, where stocks are a lot of yahoos, a lot of day traders, a lot of people that listen to what some uh, clown on a financial uh, TV show tells them and goes out and, and does it. That's not how gold acts. Around the, yeah, you might have retail people jump in and they see an ad on TV and they say, well, I'm gonna, you know, and they buy gold. But the real movements in gold are so powerful because it's the big informed money moving. The major political figures, the, the oligarchs in Russia, the royal families in the Middle East, the, you know, the, the big bankers and in, in the big industrialists in Europe and North America, when they move, they know why they're moving. That's why gold has gone nowhere the last few months, and gold has been telling you no QE. It's been clear when everybody's saying, oh, the bank of England, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And no, no, no. And gold is telling you that. So, yeah, gold, you know, gold's manipulated down and up in, in whatever way. But the, what, the gold is a very important market. Not every day. But when the big moves are going and the important things are occurring, that's the reason why gold moves the way it does. What we've seen in periods of consolidation over the last 10 years is that following a period of price consolidation, down, sideways, what have you, it can last anywhere from nine months to 18 months. And we've seen 50, 60 percent moves following that, which you were just mentioning, this last major move higher in gold. It broke all the past records, at least to this decade, moved up 109%, and the volume was very intriguing, and, and there was a broader interest, and, and it was bigger money. But yeah, the issue in terms of the election, and I think coming bringing the point back around to some time sensitivity in the marketplace today, we have an outcome that is really, no one knows, is it going to be the Dems, is it going to be Republicans? Post-election market concerns, you know, if you said, okay, Obama returns to the Oval Office, under that scenario, what's your post-election market concerns? Or vice versa. Right. It doesn't matter who wins. You're going to have a really tough 2013 and beyond. And the reason we don't know, we know 2013 will be tough because all the election rigs are falling apart. All this stuff's going to hit the fan. What we don't know is the policies that will be implemented. That is what's going to determine the depth and duration of whatever ugliness appears in 2013 economically. We don't know. You don't know if the Senate goes, you, you just don't know how this thing comes out. What I would, my best guess here is for investing is that in the short term, if Obama wins, I think you'll see gold take off. I think you'll see that, that kind of dynamic in here because they're, you know, they're going to go, they're going to think, well, he's going to try to you know, inflate or do whatever, confiscate, you know, anything. Gold isn't just, people don't quite understand gold. It is partially an inflation hedge, but it doesn't really do a good job as other assets do against inflation. Not price it in real time. No, it doesn't track on a day-to-day -day basis by any means. No. What gold is is really is a bet against government. I mean, that, and that's why the big government people hate gold, because it's always been an encumberment throughout history. Back to the Greeks and Romans, it, it encumbers big government and, and wanton spending. And it's, it is a hedge against politics. It's, that's your biggest hedge. So if Romney wins, gold's going to have a tough go for a while. And again, it depends on what policies show up. 
I don't think we've seen the long-term peaking goal because we have too much in the world that has to be resolved, whether it's the U.S., that, that problem. Let's face it. And the thing we, why the big money is going to, no matter who wins, is going to keep some portion of the goal is because we don't know how the debt problem is going to be ultimately re- resolved. There's three ways to get out of it. One is totally improbable at this point. That is to grow the economy. The debt is so large now. The studies show it actually has an economic encumbrance now. You just can't get it going. Uh, just like a business. You have a good business. You take on debt to expand whatever. Yeah, you can grow your way out. But if you take on so much debt that there's no way you can pay that payment, and it starts, then you have to cannibalize your business. That's what is happening now to sovereign governments all over the world. So now you're left with two solutions. And we've talked about this before. You either can inflate or you can default. And every government tries to inflate. We've been doing this for decades. And eventually, you hit the point where you jump to a hyperinflation or you just default, which is what Russia did in 1998, which a lot of state municipalities are going to have to do because they can't print money. And that is what nobody knows. Nobody has an idea what this end game is going to look like. So for people, you've got to have a good hedged portfolio right now and flexibility to move once policies start appearing and once things start happening. And that's what's going to make this even more problematic is you don't know from country to country what their policies are going to be or how their, their legislatures are, are going to vote and what policies are coming this way. But we do know you've got this major debt problem in Japan, which nobody's talking about, which is even a bigger debt problem than Germany. And there's a lot of things here that have to be resolved. So that being the point, we all know the basis of financial assets are government bonds. And if you start questioning the value of government bonds and ability to pay back, that's where the real crisis will be, as you see in Greece, Italy, on and on. If that starts spreading to France, then to Germany, then to the UK, Japan, US, that's the game changer. Now, the big money over big periods of time, and the big private money plays it masterfully because they don't care about what their performance looks like month to month, quarter to quarter, even year to year. They just want the big trend right. The big money is made moving from real assets to paper assets. In the 80s, that was the game. If you go back in the 70s and you look at the wealthiest people in the world, you had people like Daniel Ludwig, you had uh, it was oil, gas, shipping, real estate. You know, games like Kluge, whether it was Howard Hughes and his real estate and, and Hughes tool in these industries. When you got, as you transit, the, the hunt brought, you just went through it. That's where your big wealth. Marvin Davis, you know, worldwide. Yeah, you had the Bellsbergs, the uh, Bronfmans in Canada. It was resources and real estate. But they had to make the transition. Well, right. By the 90s, you had, you know, you had the Gates and the Buffets and you know, those type of, you know, the, the tech guys and Larry Allison and on and on. But it was the paper profit. Now, who played it right? Well, the Bass Brothers did. Bass Brothers made the transition. The Bass Brothers were a Texas family of oil, gas, real estate. They had the insight to see something was happening here with Volk or whatever, and they brought in Richard Rainwater from Goldman, and they brought in the convertible arbitrage team from Kidder, and they played it masterfully. They made so much money in the 80s, they, they effectively dropped out of sight. In the 90s, they did a little of the RTC buying, and they just disappeared. Now, the point here is you've got to move your money from hard assets, whether it's real estate, oil, gas, gold, whatever, to paper, and then you've got to make that transition. Now, in the last decade, gold and commodities took off and outperformed stocks by far. But here's your problem if you go to the 80s. You've got to be liquid in transition periods. So in other words, the basses couldn't just go and buy stocks like crazy. In 79, 80, they would have got killed. They transitioned. They got out of their oil and gas, got liquid, did some nibbling around the periphery. And then when the move appeared in earnest, they could go. Where the hunts went bankrupt and other people similarly went bankrupt, they were ready to go. That's why I can't emphasize enough not to get too doctrinaire here. Don't make too big of a commitment either way right now. Have a nice balanced portfolio so that if something happens very quickly, you are in a position where you're not going to get killed, but also you're in a position to play through this transition because you know, we're not anywhere near the end game yet. You know, we're, we're getting closer, no doubt, and that's going to be very tough to navigate. You know, we've suggested for clients just in general. I mean, this is a very broad scope, and of course it can be refined, but you know, third in cash, third in gold, third in equities, you know, where you have some balance and you're not making a commitment one way or the other, default or inflation, because either one could be an outcome. And you have a growth thematic, you know, sort of a, a call, if you will, on recovery in your equities, but you're more than covered in terms of an insurance policy if you do see a collapse in the derivatives market or something that really impairs your personal balance sheet, gold's there to put it back on, 
usually as a multiplier, seeing a decent growth in that environment. So it's tough. It's tough to say you're going to be 100% right because you don't know the future and how it's exactly going to play. You can't put all your chips on one particular number, so to say. Absolutely right. Nobody alive has lived through what we're going through right now. And again, this is where central banks and sovereign governments solve this easy in question. And we can pretend it's not, because if you stop pretending, then the whole game is over. So right now, you have to pretend that the, the Bank of England and the ECB and the, the Fed can protect everybody. And, and people realize you can't. And we see that and the governments can't bail out everybody anymore. People understand that, but you just keep playing the game. When you see these periods in history where you have financial crisis and then they cobble together something, there's a bailout. You got to ask yourself, you know, who's the pansy? Who's getting bailed out? And what are those people doing? If the bailout was good, and after a year or two, the insiders thought everything would be great, you would see private equity people buying up companies like you did in the 80s. It'd be worse. In the 80s, there's only a couple, three big KKR, and you had uh, Teddy Forsman and uh, just a couple, you know, a couple other guys that were takeover players. Now, there's a gazillion guys. There's trillions of dollars out there. How come they're not buying up companies after such a good deal? Just because just what you said, you don't know. You don't know what the policies are going to be. You don't know what's coming down the line. So you're freezing people. You're just freezing people to sit here, watch, and wait. So that, you know, again, you're right. You can't get out there and make these big empirical decisions right now because you don't have the necessary information to make them. And the question, again, is the government, the solvency of the government, because once that comes into question, then the solvency of the central bank comes into question. And now you're blowing up you know, the mental paradigm and the street paradigm and, and decades of financial paradigms. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, I, it's going to be a challenging game and you just got to make sure you're in a position to play it. What we've tried to do well in advance of this is, you know, with our wealth management program started in 2008, looking at a major transition, we placed billions of dollars into the metals markets and, you know, to see that duly rewarded, but also in a timely fashion. And I, I think one of the critical things that you just hit on is an, an exit strategy, a reduction strategy from hard assets. You may have to move to a liquid position for some period of time. You mentioned the Bass Brothers. They sat in cash largely for two years. Right. And as you say, they nibbled, but they didn't go in whole hog. Frankly, the whole period, right now, tomorrow, the next 10 years, it's just going to be uncomfortable. As an investor, you're not going to have certainty. And if that's what helps you sleep at night, it's not possible. Right. No, no it, it is. It's different. The one thing we know is that what we have now is unsustainable. And if it's unsustainable, it means it's something different will emerge. And there's good. And you're going to get a good indication in the election how they, with the American people where they want to go and how you want to go forward here. And we'll start knowing more. So if you get a Romney when you will get stocks, it will go up. It'll be just like Reagan. You get an end of year rally, you get a first quarter rally, then you're going to get the medicine. Wasn't that about a three month period, though? I mean, you know, following Carter, it was, yeah, but then 18 months of pain. Oh, it was, you're right. It was ugly pain down until July of 82. It was very tough, very, very tough medicine. But it set up the big boom period. They bought us 20 years. And then everything started going back down again because, you know, we, we blew it. We, we had a series of uh, pretty bad presidents in, in Congress there that blew it, squandered what they were giving them. They, you know, they had a toga party instead of doing what they should have done, reforming the uh, entitlement programs and, and getting a flat tax in here on, on business and, and individual. There's a lot of things that could have been done that weren't done. They just perpetuated the game. Just as, a, as kind of an overview, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground today. You know, just interested, not interested, and maybe two seconds of why. Your thoughts on munis, treasuries, real estate, U.S. equities, gold, silver. Yeah, I mean, again, there's a lot more that can be said. But we're coming down to sort of game time and where people are going to take a reappraisal of risk. What does that mean? Reappraisal of risk. What's the impact to munis, treasuries, real estate, and what have you? Well, in each one of these things, let's start with the munis. You've got to be in munis that are solid municipalities. There are plenty out there, especially in the farm belt and in the mountain states. They're solid. We want to avoid the big welfare centers. You know, New York, California, Los Angeles. Everybody knows. And maybe you want to be politically correct. Not not politically correct, but you you don't want to bring politics into it. But we know where the financial problems in this country are. I'm living one here in you know Chicago and Illinois. And you have the same problems where you have the big cities. You've got the problems. Now you do see the ones going bankrupt, the Scranton's and the VA Hills and whatever. So you got to be careful. But there are plenty of good munis out there. The problem for people is they buy funds or ETFs, and in some cases, you're buying blind pool. You don't know what's in it. It's incumbent upon people to do work right now. You don't just trust blindly. 
You know, the economic data is garbage right now. It's, it's manipulated. The earnings are, are garbage, on and on. So you have whatever you own, you better know. And it's not, well, I just have XYZ mutual fund or, or XYZ bond fund. You better know what's in that. You better do the work and get online and look and see what they're holding in there. Or we're going to be answering the question, who's the patsy? <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have another 2008, just like, oh, well, it's AAA rated. Oh, you mean like all those subprime structured vehicles that blew up were nothing but garbage? Are you going to rely on rating agencies or brokerage firms? Yeah, ask people how much money they lost doing that. You've got to get out there and do your work. So, Treasuries, we've got one issue is we can certainly see the 10-year go to one, one and a quarter with a major squeeze in Europe and panic buying. So it's not as if Treasuries are going to hit a wall tomorrow. But on the other hand, we are talking about that being the looming threat. Well, the biggest threat, the trade of a lifetime is when the bond market blows up. If you're a trader, and everybody knows it. The problem is all, it's a question of timing. These rates are not going to last. They can't pay. You know, it's unbelievable. It's going to be just like Greece. Once the rates back up, they're just going to go geometrically. But in the meantime, people understand what the bond market. Most sophisticated people understand the U.S. bond market is a safe haven right now. It's not your home. It's a Motel 6. You know, you're in here because you're hiding out for a while. And you better be able to move out of that when you need to. You talk about real estate. Again, it's very selective. Coastal properties are doing well. Metropolitan, again, the big centers where there's a lot of government dependency are struggling because you have incredible deficits and they're going to come after you. They need the funding. One of two things are going to happen. They have to cut services, which will create problems, or they have to raise taxes. And when they raise taxes, they're going to go for the people who have money. One of the reasons why you're having a difficulty in, a, in real estate rebound is you don't want to pay the taxes on these properties. You just can't, and a lot of people can't. So you got to be careful where you have your real estate. Now, farmland has been great. It's probably a little overvalued now because of the, uh, not probably, it is overvalued now because of the, of the drought and the way the, the prices ran up and the foreign buying and on and on. But I think, I think real estate is going to be a better investment over the next decade or so than stocks are. Because again, it's a real asset. If you do your work and you find good properties, a good property, good situations. Yeah, I think I think that's a nice hedge against whatever might be coming down the road. But I'd be very careful with condominiums in major metropolitan areas where there's financial difficulty. You've got to avoid the areas where there's financial difficulty because you're going to get sucked in and you're not going to be able to flip those things. Not until the crisis really hits where they, you want to buy Detroit properties. You might, they might not be bad now. I don't know how well they can go, but you didn't want to buy them five years ago, 10 years ago, or 15 or 20. And that's what you got to be careful of. I think the properties you've got to look for are where the baby boomer is going to retire to. And from the, from the demographic patterns, it's going to be low tax states, low property tax states, but also states where there's not the huge social service burdens. And you can see you know, people are moving, whether it's Arkansas, Tennessee, you know, you get the Utah, the mountain states, on and on and on. And again, probably it's the same area where you have very good rated municipal bonds is probably where you want to look for real estate investments. Back, the gold and silver, I think, is in a holding pattern. I do think if you don't, own physical gold or silver, you should have some in here. It's like life insurance. People need life insurance. In fact, if you're wealthy enough, you don't need life insurance. But the more money you have, the more you'll need gold and you need that kind of insurance, which is kind of, you know, people always talk about being insurance. But to me, it's almost uh, a little bit inversely of importance than normal life insurance. Because again, if you have a lot of money, you don't need life insurance, except for estate planning to avoid taxes. But the more wealth you have, the more you need some kind of hedge. The other thing that people want to talk about, too, up is the in the system. There's custodial risk, you know, and, and we saw this in 2008. That major firms are going to go down, and people, you lose your stock, you lose your customer account, you lose whatever. And of course, it hasn't been solved because we see what's happened here with MF Global and Peregrine. So again, this is another reason why the big private money is into physical gold and silver. Is you don't have custodial risk. You've got it. Now it depends on you where you want to store it, how you want to store it, and if you want to take it in coins or bullion. But, you know, you take that custodial risk out, and it's very, very important right now. I do. I have both physical gold and silver in a lockbox, and it's, it's fine. It's comforting, and that's fair. Stocks, stocks to me, are the, are the toughest right here because we know it's so divorced from economic reality, and it's so much of a central bank gimmick right now. It's very tough. I think if you're going to you hold a percentage of stocks, again, I think you should be – diversity is always something people throw out, but I think it's incumbent now because, again, we don't know what's going to play. But I think if you're looking longer term, where you can see some of the smarter money going, there's been a lot of moving to defensive plays over the last year because there'll be no economy. Anybody paying attention to this economy, it stinks. 
But where you see people moving is to healthcare, biotechnology, and this is a big function of baby boomers all getting older. And also, I think you keep an eye on natural gas. And the natural gas prices have gone up. They're probably going to get ready to roll over because part of that rally is a lot of traders buying. There's a lot of uh, buying because of uh, the anticipation of QE and people are buying baskets of commodities. But on a long term, you're going to see more and more implementation of natural gas. There's an article we had in a letter today that showed up yesterday about CO2 emissions in the U.S. are at, an all, at a 20-year low. And they cite the main reason they cite is that there's more natural gas being used for uh, power plants and less coal. And right now, there's a lot of people out there trying to figure out how to start getting more natural gas use, not just in the factories, but also into railroads, heavy industrial users. Now, it's hard in the retail market. You know, people are talking about you know, getting cars around that. Obviously, that's a very hard logistical question. It's much easier for railroads in a big private industry that has, has uh, terminals or controls enormous use as opposed to trying to get tens of millions of people to make the switch. So this is something I think in the future, you know, if you're looking for certain certain areas to go in, you've got to think long-term. You've got to think something that you are comfortable holding for over four or five years and that you can see something is going to happen. You see everybody's running to Apple and these companies. It is very, very difficult to project what tech companies are going to look like in four or five years, let alone 10 years, because it changes so rapidly and competitors jump up so quickly. It's very difficult. So I think you know those are some areas. I think you want to avoid some of the home builders because people have been buying them like crazy. They're ridiculously priced now relative to economic reality. And I do think you you got to be careful the consumer discretionary here. One of the reasons the consumer non-discretionary, one of the reasons this is held up, is done well, is because of all the entitlement programs and welfare and, and aid programs that have gone on over the last four years. Is the money kept pouring into consumers to spend it? Walmart or McDonald's and whatever, but you're seeing that start. You're seeing Walmart and McDonald's now are having difficulty in the last quarter or two. That's a really interesting sign because in 2008, everybody said you got to buy Walmart, you got to buy Dollar General, you got to buy McDonald's because people's going to move their consumption down, but the base consumption will be maintained. And it was largely through entitlement spending and it increased uh, unemployment benefits and disability claims jumping and food stamps increasing. But now you're hitting a point where that's even rolling over. That's an area to be careful in because you're going to see the government's cutting back after the election and all these different types of programs. So that's been a hot area. If you look at the chart, you can see people are already starting, the smart marines are already starting to walk a little bit away from that. Back to sort of big picture, we look at the Chinese slowdown. We look at the euro crisis, which is anything but resolved yet. You know, six, 12, 18 months from now, have we scuttled a couple of the members? Spain gone? Is, is Greece gone? What's your best guess in terms of the eurozone? Greece is effectively gone now. It's, it's just everybody's just pretending. So you've had three bailouts of Greece. And what is absolutely ludicrous, is, I think it was a week or two ago, you've got the Troika and the people there actually in Greece saying, we're going to look and see if they're meeting the conditions to give them the second bail. Out. Oh, by the way, let's give them a quick $6 billion here because they can't make their payments. How ludicrous is that? You're talking about whether you're going to give them a, a second bailout money, and you're giving them a short-term bailout because they can't make ends meet. So, you know, what, what kind of, who, who are you fooling? Well, the only people you're fooling are the people that are intractables, that they're going to be bullish no matter what. I mean, it's over. So this is, I think, a decent test case if you look at Greece or Spain, for that matter. If they pull out, obviously they're going back to their own currency. Buying the Greek equity market today, buying uh, the, the IBEX if you want to go to Spain, don't you have the same issue? You can have currency devaluation, and even though things have dropped 80%, 90%, you can still lose 50% of your value in the currency exchange. Well, you see, now, what you're bringing up now is a very, very important investment issue that sophisticated people are starting to think here. Is if, and I mentioned this before, is that I want to buy the euro when everything blows up. Once you start pulling these people out, because it's just like if you've got a company that's got is hemorrhaging red ink, and all of a sudden you just shut down, you just throw out all the, all the worst divisions. That stock gets better because you're not hemorrhaging. Exactly, exactly. And is that the case? If you, if all of a sudden this stuff starts happening, and if you're out of cost, you're right. You're going to get people are going to just dump stuff in Europe. But if anybody would have a, a brain understands that the U.S. has been a safe haven, one of the reasons why the, the U.S. bonds and stocks have rallied here is because money in Europe has come in here. 
You even I've seen in properties like in Cancun or whatever. Uh, it's usually North American money. In the last year, it's been heavy European money coming in to buy the coastal properties in there. Because if you're a wealthy person in Europe and you have a bank account, you look at it, it's denominated in euros. What's it going to be worth six months from now? A year? I don't know. So I have got to get rid of these. I don't know what it's going to look like. So you buy real things. But your corporate analogy is great because you're really just talking about the areas within your business that are non-core or that are bleeding off the center. And as soon as you scuttle them, you're going back to core competencies, core business, core productivity, core cash flow. It's great. So you don't own the euro now, but you own it on the other side of yeah, Spain getting spun off, Greece getting spun off. Right. And, and the one thing we know is because of this uncertainty, European euro-denominated assets are going to be suppressed in price. So what I think everybody should be looking at very carefully are good, solid, legitimate European companies that are domiciled in a country that's not going to go socialist crazy, like France. We're going to put all these ridiculous rates on you. So those prices of these companies are going to be suppressed, especially when this stuff hits the fan. So that being the point, there's where you're going to find the best equity values is going to be in European companies when it's hitting the fan. And again, you got to make sure they're a legitimate company, solid balance sheet, solid products, and they're also going to be domiciled in a country that isn't going to confiscate a big chunk of their assets or encumber them with policies that crimp their growth. So that's one of the things you're going to be looking for there. And you can see it'll be the strong currencies because the currency guys are the smartest guys. They're the informed guys. So you'd be talking Northern Europe. You know, you'd be talking in that Finland, Norway, you know, that those kind of people in there that... Uh, yeah, they're socialist degree, but they're small populations with big resources, you know, Norway with the oil and on and on. Uh, maybe Germany to a degree to see how that plays out in there. You got to let the UK blow up a lot more before those industries are going to be there. But, and that's the point here, where the people in Wall Street and on financial TV say, buy, sell. No, no, no. That's not how this game works. This game works by looking for opportunities and waiting. Patience, patience, patience. Patience. And it's not just that they get cheap, because things can get a lot cheaper. And if you've got enough resources, you can nibble. And that's what the, the big guys do. You, when they get ridiculously cheap, you nibble. You might have to nibble for a couple of years before something turns. But once the catalyst appears, and they're usually pretty clear, you know, like Reagan, Volcker, these type of things, when it starts going, you'll see the money surge. So when you see the private equity guys start pouring into Europe, and you see U.S. companies starting to buy up European companies, you better get involved. And right now, the reason you can't do it is because you don't know the game. The same thing there is. You know it's over for Greece and, and a number of the other countries, but you don't know what comes next. So, oh, yeah, this looks great. I'll go in there and buy Greece. And it goes to some military junta or some way leftist country with, you know, 80, 90 percent. Who knows? You don't know. But you do your work and you have your buy list and your buy companies. And when the events start telling you that things are going to go the right way, then you start going in. And that's what people have to do. You got to be patient. You're right. You're absolutely right. And right now, you shouldn't be doing anything because there's nothing to do. One thing I learned as a trader, you know, smart traders understand you're paid to watch. People come in every day that have this urge to play. Either they're desperate because they got to pay their bills and they're trying to generate income, or they're inveterate gamblers. And if, if you're going to be a gambler, you better be gambling from the inside, which you know Wall Street does in a large degree. But if you're not gambling from the inside, you better wait, wait for a fat, fat hand to play. Well, listen, always great to have you in the conversation. And um, your letter is uh, one of the most invaluable things we have access to on a regular basis, the King Report, and should be required reading for anyone on Wall Street. Great to have you on the program again, and uh, look forward to continuing our conversation. Well, thank you, guys. It's always a pleasure. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, Bill King. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.